and, and at the time, I would have never thought that there was any possibility of my, me ever calling myself a Christian again. Like, that was, that was my past, that was my childhood, those were my formative years. I left that behind, and the idea that I would ever go back there would have almost been laughable to me at the time. Hello, and thanks for joining in. I'm Jana Harmon, and you're listening to Side B Stories, where we see how skeptics flip the record of their lives. You can also hear today's story and see other video testimonies on our Side B Stories website. You can find at www.sidebstories.com. Each podcast, we listen to someone who has once been an atheist, but who became a Christian against all odds. Each story is different. Each journey courses a different path. Everyone has their reasons for belief and for disbelief. There are the reasons that sound good and reasonable as supporting our beliefs, and then there are the real reasons underneath the surface, sometimes presumed and unexplored, sometimes not particularly rational. One of the most interesting findings in my research with former atheists was the difference between the reasons they gave for atheism which they said were mostly based upon reason, science, and evidence, and in hindsight, the real reasons they said why they rejected God and belief in Christianity. It turns out, on self-reflection, that one-fourth of them actually rejected God solely for more personal rather than intellectual or rational reasons. For the remaining three-quarters, it was a mixture of both the personal and the intellectual. As humans, we are holistic beings. We are all susceptible to rationalizing what we want to be true. Of course, our desires and objective truth may line up, but sometimes it's good to be skeptical of our own beliefs, to look more deeply at why we believe what we believe. In our story today, Rich was compelled to examine his own beliefs, first as a Christian, and he found his beliefs wanting. Then, as a militant atheist, he became skeptical of his own skepticism. As an academic and deeply introspective and contemplative thinker, he became willing to look at his intellectual reasons for atheism, but also beneath the surface to the real reasons below. I hope you'll come along to hear what he found along his journey from belief to disbelief and then back to a much stronger belief in God and Christianity than he once knew. Welcome to Side B Stories, Rich. It's so great to have you with me today. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. So the listeners know a little bit about you. Can you tell us a bit about who you are, where you live, uh, your education perhaps? Sure, yeah. My name is uh, Dr. Rich Saplita. Uh, my wife, Mary Catherine, and I, we live in Athens, Georgia, and we do a lot of ministry uh, at the University of Georgia with Georgia students. Uh, my educational background, I did my undergraduate at West Virginia University, which is my home state, and then came to the University of Georgia in 2000. Uh, from 2000 to 2005, I was a PhD student, uh, earned my master's, and then my PhD in psychology. Uh, with an emphasis on neuroscience and psychopharmacology, and uh, went on to teach as a lecturer at the University of Georgia for about 10 years after that. Wow. Okay. So you're an academic by training and history, and but it sounds like you've moved a completely different direction from that, and I can't wait to hear all about it. Now, let's get into your story from childhood. Uh, I know that Part of your story is that you were a militant atheist, but you didn't start that way. Why don't you let uh, bring us into your world as a child? Talk to us about your family, um, your community, friends, culture. Was God in the, in any of that at all? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, he was very much so. I I was uh, raised in a uh, middle class, you know, blue collar family in. Um, North Central West Virginia, a little town there called Fairmont, West Virginia. And um, my family and I, we were members of a Church of Christ. And so, you know, it was a three times a week thing. We were very much in the habit of going to church. I learned a lot of Bible growing up, Bible verses, uh, Sunday school, all of that. So 
yeah, God was very much in the picture. Uh, although I, I really, it never really resonated with me on a deeply personal level. So you went through the routine and I guess the ritual of going to, to church three times a week, but it never took personally for you. Uh, through that period of time, would you ever say that there was an, even an intellectual ascent to belief in God? Was it something that you had accepted on that level, although you didn't accept it personally, perhaps? Oh, yes, absolutely. I did believe that it was true. Um, and, you know, th there was good and bad there. It wasn't all uh, a negative thing. Uh, there were certainly positives. I, I believed it factually. Um, and I would say, and, and part of this was a product of the time <laughs> in uh, American evangelicalism at the time, there was a big emphasis on fire and brimstone brimstone, eternal judgment. And, uh, you know, of course, that is a, a true part of the Bible. It needs to put, be put into perspective. But as a child, I really r remember thinking of God as uh, a God who, di who was displeased with me, who didn't like me, who almost was, um, you know, a, a God that I was terrified to really approach. And uh, I, I, I really think I just had no understanding of grace growing up. And for that reason, it was easy for it to uh, not make its way into my heart. I went through the, you know, the protocol that I learned, okay. uh, what must a person do to become a Christian? Because I did believe it intellectually. I did believe that it was factually true. I, I hadn't even considered um, that it might not be. And so uh, I, I wanted to be on the right side of eternity. <laughs> Um, and, and so I went through the protocol that my particular denomination offered. And um, I, I do remember feeling a certain peace when that happened, but um, there was no life change. I, I really went back to being the same kid, the same teenager that, that I always had been. And um, there was no real desire uh, in my heart to pursue Christ for truth's sake, pursue Christ for the sake of Christ being, you know, the son of God and true and worthy um, of my worship. Mm. So you lived with this, I guess, rather tentative belief, uh, belief in the sense that it wasn't taken personally or with life change. Um, how long did you express belief in God, and when did doubts or, or kind of resistance or rejection of that start to come? Yeah, so I retained my belief in God and even, I would say, religious practice, uh, going to church maybe not three times a week, but on a very regular basis um, throughout my undergraduate years at West Virginia mm -hmm. University. I do think it was sometime during that time frame, especially towards the end, maybe my, the last year, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, um, that I started for the first time really questioning um, the possibility of, well, maybe Christianity is wrong. Maybe, uh, maybe there's some truth here, but beliefs like the Bible is the perfect word of God started to question that. I, like many college students do, I really came to question the creation narrative. Um, did God create uh, like Genesis 1 and 2 says he did, or is that just a metaphor for evolutionary processes over billions of years? And uh, so I was really wrestling with those questions at the time, but I would say that the real, the, the, the deep skepticism didn't set in then. That was something that came more uh, during my graduate school years. Okay. Because I would imagine as a psychology or pursuing psychology at the university level that I would imagine a lot of the coursework is, is through the framework of a naturalistic or materialistic kind of, of thinking. It was, was that influential in your, in your pushing back against these kind of um, narratives that you were finding a bit unbelievable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's what I really remember. And, you know, the, there are only certain snapshots that, when I look back, stick out in my mind. 
And of course, you have a whole life that's being lived there with anybody's story, uh, regardless of whatever direction they're moving toward or away from, there are a lot of complicating factors. <laughs> um, what I remember in terms of the classroom and academia, what I was learning during my graduate school years, um, there was a specifically a history of psychology class and a, a seminar for graduate students. We have 15, maybe 20 students in there. I'm one of the students. And, you know, I love this professor. He was a uh, semi-retired professor emeritus and just loved his personality. Great guy. I, he just really I connected with him. He had a very warm heart, was very approachable. And, um, but, you know, but he was, from what I could discern, um, adamantly a, a disbeliever in anything supernatural. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's where... That, that's where um, the enemy, and I want to be clear, this, this man is not my enemy. We have an enemy of our souls, Satan. But I think that's where the enemy does his best work, is through um, people that come into our lives that are very disarming, that we have uh, their words, their beliefs, their philosophies that are you know, certainly um, counter to the Bible. And so I, I remember a big part of the class was really instilling this uh, metaphysical position of naturalism, of physicalism, um, the idea that when it comes to understanding the brain, the human mind, you know, that is the subject matter of psychology, that really understanding it as a machine is the proper way to, to view it, that it is a mechanical thing, uh, mechanical problems lead to psychological problems, Damage to the brain causes these different types of dysfunction. And uh, consequently, a corollary of that would be that, you know, the mind is what the brain does, nothing more and nothing less. So did that then cause you to question your own spiritual nature? Yeah, I think it did. Um, I still was, um, I was still involved with Christianity, but it was becoming more and more in a marginalized sense. I was, you know, previously married. My wife, Mary Catherine, was previously married. Um, my now ex-wife and I, we were members of a church where when we moved from Savannah up to this area of Georgia. And um, so there was still a connection to Christianity, but I increasingly disbelieved it, I would say. It became something that, you know, what was really resonating to me was science. You know, I'm a neuroscience student. I do scientific research. I, uh, th this book is outmoded. It's outdated. Hey, maybe there's some good things in there. You know, religion's not all bad. It can give a person a sense of culture and, and kind of a background, a way to connect with family and certain friends. But in terms of it being objectively true, I had pretty much uh, checked out at that point. Mm -hmm. So this this religion that you had semi or I guess intellectually believed, you found very strong intellectual reasons to leave it behind. Right. In, in terms of my personal conviction, I yeah. It, 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 the, at that point, did God? The question, did God exist? I probably would say I don't know. I would have probably said probably not. There's probably not a personal God um, who could is is described in these uh, books that we call the Bible. That's probably more, much more myth and legend, embellishing different nationalistic stories in the Old Testament, a lot of wishful thinking in the New Testament among uh, desperate people. And that's, I, I didn't think about it a lot, but I think that would characterize pretty much where I was at the time. Mm. Yeah, so, so you left it behind, I guess, for many years of your your life, you had believed it, but I guess in your twenty something, as you become became educated, you became, uh, I guess, in a way, too smart to believe that kind of superstition. Yeah, you you mentioned um, or inferred, I guess, that Christians essentially it was were uneducated, perhaps a little bit ignorant, uh, and they li they believed a book that just doesn't hold up to. Um, to what an educated person would actually believe. So as you're, as you're moving forward, 
Um, what are you finding? Are you, is it, are, do you, do you move into atheism by default or does it become more of an intentional decision and identity? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think there was actually both of those. I think there were two phases there. I think that the, um, kind of what I have been describing up into this point was more by default, more passive, you know, you're in graduate school and, I remember I, I still went to a Bible study the first year or two that I was on campus at UGA as a grad student. And, you know, you become sort of like a family with your lab partners, your major professor, the fellow graduate students. You just do life with these people. You do classes, seminars, go to conferences together. They really become like your siblings. And, um, you know, they, they jokingly got me a little action figure Jesus uh, one of my for a birthday present one year, and <laughs> I, I thought it was hilarious because I really, I, I wasn't a, an evangelical Christian by then. I just was still going to Bible study, but I was kind of the first couple years there. I was like the, you know, it was, it was funny for them to uh, playfully, gently mock, shall we say, my my residual beliefs. Um, but as I said, you know, during that trek through grad school, I became more and more influenced by these folks, their their worldview, their politics, um, their um, devotion to science. Uh, th- that was such a strong association. Um, and we know that the word science can be used in many different senses, right? But the idea that I'm a scientist, you know, science says X, um, you know, that's this topic of the Bible or Jesus or the apostles, that's religion. And that's an inf- much inferior, a far inferior way of knowing and experiencing reality than uh, the scientific method is. And so that was the, the passive part of it. Um, the more deliberative stage really, um, you know, came, I think, in the, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of being on the receiving end of divorce documents. And I think that had to do with, in retrospect, a lot of that had to do with uh, emotional pain that I didn't understand at the time as pain, but it was, I think, reflexive and sort of catapulted me more into um, what we might call militant atheism. That's interesting that you revealed that, that there was some kind of emotional pain that catapulted you into a more militant atheism. I'm trying to hear and and possibly infer the connection there. Why emotional pain would push you towards a more militant atheism? Why do you suppose that was? Yeah, and I'm, you know, I just I want to preface my statement with I'm just talking about myself. I, I'm right. certainly not. I want to be clear. I'm not trying to insinuate that all atheists are angry people who are mad at God. And um, no, I can't speak for them. They have their own stories, and when they tell me, I, I, I listen to them and I believe what they say. For me personally, in in my own situation, um, I really do think it was a a disappointment with God more than a disbelief in God. Mm-hmm. Um, I because again, I didn't. I had sort of jettisoned the Bible, but uh, the idea that there was something higher, you know, a higher power. Um, <laughs> I would go back and forth. The psychologist in me would say, well, that's just a residual thing from your childhood going to church. But there was something that seemed to go beyond that. But I I was disappointed in this God for my own failures, uh, for the failures of my marriage, my my family, um, the fact that I was not going to be a daily presence in the life of my three daughters anymore. Mm. And uh, that, that was the big one. That was the big one. More than, I think, grieving the actual dissolution of the marriage, it was, we're not going to be an intact family anymore. And there was a sense, I don't know if I really thought of it in my mind at the time this way. I don't think I would have put it into these words but a really a sense in which like God or the universe or whatever you want to call it, my higher power had failed me or let me down. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about our new Side B Stories website. Perhaps you or someone you know is questioning whether or not belief in God is even possible or credible, whether or not Christianity is worthy of belief. The trouble is, in our culture today, Christianity is viewed 
largely as a belief system for the weak, delusional and uneducated, it can be extremely difficult to break through the negativity and stereotypes to explore authentic, historic Christianity. If you're a skeptic or atheist, what would it take for you to consider the reality of God or the truth of Christianity? Or if you're a Christian, how can you better understand or engage with skeptics in a meaningful way? Our new Side B Stories website was created with you in mind. In addition to housing our podcast stories, it also features short video testimonies from former atheists and resources they have recommended or written about their own journeys to believe. And you'll hear their advice to skeptics on how to pursue a search for God and advice to Christians on how to engage with those who don't believe. We offer these stories from former skeptics on the Side B Stories website because there is no bigger question that affects your life than whether or not God is real or true, good or relevant, in a culture where Christianity is sometimes viewed unworthy of belief Side B Stories shows what it did and does take for skeptics to become believers. You can find all of this by going to our new website, SideBStories.com. We hope you'll take a look and share this wonderful resource with skeptics and Christians alike. Now back to our story. So yes, I, I can see then where disbelief would be both intellectual and personal or emotional in that sense that there were a lot of reasons to push away from this God um, who you you once believed as a child. So how long were you in this particular phase of your life and what did that look like walking as a militant atheist? Somewhere around the year 2002 and 2003, I checked out and then my return to Christianity at least in terms of believing it to be factually true, and maybe we can get into this more later, um, was late in 2011. And so roughly, I'm going to say roughly an eight-year period of time that I would have said, um, and and at the time I would have never thought that there was any possibility of me ever calling myself a Christian again. Like that that was my past, that was my childhood, those were my formative years. I left that behind, and the idea that I would ever go back there would have almost been laughable to me at the time. Mm. Did you move into a, a strongly atheistic community that were uh, that was reinforcing and supporting your ideas? Yeah, I, I think so. I do remember um, coming across the the God delusion, which was the the real. The, probably the most popular of what are called the New Atheist books. Uh, of course, that one by Richard Dawkins. Um, I, I would say that was really my entrance point to uh, a more militant variety of atheism. Like, I'm not just a skeptic now. I'm actually going to uh, to wear, to own, uh, to, to appropriate this title, Atheist. And I'm not going to be ashamed of that. So I, of course, I read uh, I read Dawkins, and that sort of introduced me to the other new atheists, uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, a philosopher. And I would say probably what ended up being the most influential of all to me actually was um, the, the podcast, the internet show out of Austin, Texas with Matt Dillahunty, mm-hmm. the atheist experience, spending many, many hours, sometimes until two in the morning, uh, watching back episodes of that. So you were really looking towards uh, becoming very saturated, I guess you could say, in the rhetoric and the in the language and the and the thinking, really, of the atheist community. So you walked in that for it looks like a period of eight or nine years. Um, what what started changing your view if if you were so ingrained? in that kind of thinking what what happened yeah. then yeah again it's you know it's challenging to try to really pinpoint um specific things and but i've, I've done that and again i don't think it was one thing but i really believe that um it, there was sort of at the same time an intellectual problem that i was developing with um 
metaphysical naturalism, okay, physicalism, materialism, it goes by different terms, this idea or doctrine that, you know, all that exists is matter, all that occurs is matter in motion. There's a universe filled with stuff, natural stuff, obeying natural laws, but there's nothing beyond that. Um, as a neuroscientist, I, I developed an intellectual problem, and it really focused on the idea, more than anything else, of free will, of, of choice or volition. Um, I, I, I have never found a way to, and this is something that philosophers have discussed at length, but I've never been able to um, reconcile metaphysical naturalism, physicalism, with the idea that there's still there's some type of capacity in human beings for uh, genuine, meaningful choice or volition. And so I really was <laughs> confused by that problem. And I knew I saw it as being a problem for my own beliefs, my own worldview at the time. And I think uh, mapped onto that roughly at the same time was just the experience of being a father to uh, three daughters. That was huge. I think I had gotten myself to the point for myself where I became kind of satisfied that, okay, I'm, I'm here on this planet for who knows how long, 50, 60, 80, maybe 100 years, and then I'm just going to die one day, and that's going to be it. You know, lights out, fade to black, and it won't matter because there won't be a me to be aware that I had ever existed. You know, one of the things that I would say as an atheist was, when people would bring up this idea of the existential problem, I would say, well, does it bother you that you were not alive 100 years ago? Does it bother, bother you that you were not alive 200 years ago? And of course, people will say no, because I wasn't alive yet. And I said, exactly. So once you and I are dead, we're not going to care that we're dead. We just won't exist anymore. So I kind of, um, I think I got into a position where I was satisfied with that for myself. But I could never get to the same level of satisfaction with that being true um, for the lives of my three daughters. Yeah, the, I can see where the existential problem could be dismissed pre and post death. But as you said, when you start looking at the implications of your own worldview and see if they're actually livable, like trying to say that free choice is an illusion, I presume that you had some differences then with Sam Harris and the way that he perceives free will. Yeah. Or as a neuroscientist, the whole concept of consciousness and where that comes from. Um, so there's the mental life, that, but there's also, again, more existentially meaning and purpose, uh, human dignity, value, those things. From, a, from an existential individual perspective, did any of those things mm -hmm. also bother you? Yeah, I think I did. I think it, it did, um, especially centered around the idea of, of justice and human rights. Mm. And it's not something I went uh, as deep in to the time. Now, I think today this has become sort of like the backbone of, of my main apologetic when mm. I interact with skeptics. But, yeah, there was the idea. Um, I remember thinking at least a bit about um, ethical systems and you know, what is the justification for human worth and dignity and value on metaphysical naturalism on, you know, my, that which was, you know, the basis for my atheism at the time, I could not get myself past uh, a utilitarian view of that. People are essentially worth their value. Their dignity is, is tantamount to their value to society, their perceived value or their real value to society. Uh, but of course, where does that leave someone who is severely physically disabled or mentally disabled or something like that? Is this a lesser person? And I would think that a person who is going to be consistent with a truly metaphysical position would have to say that that's true, although there's something that in us that recoils against uh, that notion. You know, it strikes me that as almost ironic that the more that you ventured into atheism, listening to Matt Dillahunty and reading books, that it actually surfaced some some issues or some cognitive dissonance in you that that I the logical endpoint of atheism in many different ways is a little bit difficult to take. 
or um, in terms of when you're, when you're thinking about reality and how um, just intellectually and experientially things match with reality that, that somehow that it actually surfaced some tension, areas of tension or cognitive dissonance for you that allowed you to become a little bit more skeptical of your own skepticism. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what I started experiencing. And, and so I really, I, I um, how would I phrase this? I checked out on atheism in terms of its militant variety, in terms okay. of its, you know, Richard Dawkins-esque, Mila, Matt Dillahunty-esque. <laughs> I, for a while there, I really wanted to get something like the atheist experience started in Athens. And I thought it was great what they were doing there. The I think they call themselves the atheist community of Austin, Texas. And I'm like, wow, we should be great if we had something like that here in Athens. Um, long about this time, which would have been 2010, 2011, going into 2011, I really, I'm like, okay, this is not my future. I, I'm not that convinced of these mm -hmm. things. In fact, you know, I, I, I retreated to a more moderate position. Uh, I still would have never thought that I would ever in a million years become a Bible-believing Christian again. But I, I, was, I, I wanted to retreat away from the militant atheism more to an agnosticism, a weak agnosticism, an agnosticism that really appreciated ideas uh, like the idea in NA, Narcotics Anonymous, um, of, of a higher power, you know, my mm -hmm. higher power, um, a, a guide, some type of spiritual guide that helps me get through life and relate to people and those sorts of things. And so I, I knew that I had served at this point the previous two years as the faculty advisor for UGA Atheists, a student organization um, of skeptical students on campus. It had been the Secular Student Association and eventually it went back to being the Secular Student Association. But during the years I was involved, it was called UGA Atheists. So I knew that um, going into the following year, I was I was going to say, no, you know, hey, y'all, I've, I've, had, I've had a good time. This has been fun getting to know you, but um, I'm, I'm too busy. I really, I'm, I'm not going to do that again next year. And uh, I really had just planned on leaving it there and exploring, exploring spirituality on my own. And uh, that was about the point in time that my oldest daughter, Annabelle, uh, her, her mother, my ex-wife, was, was still involved in her local church and taking uh, my daughters to Sunday school. And I received a text that says, uh, you know, Annabelle is going to be baptized um, like two Sundays from now. And it had the date and the time. And, and this is while I was the faculty advisor for UGA Atheists. And, uh, and so I received the text. And I, I don't know, I, I had mixed emotions right up front. I think it was mostly negative. Like, why are they inviting me to this? They know I'm not religious. She knows I'm not religious anymore. Is she just trying to antagonize me? Well, clearly that was like, okay, that's not the case. Um, I told a few of my skeptical friends, my atheist friends, and... You know, of course, we made the obligatory jokes about if I walked in the building, the walls will start shaking and that sort of thing. Uh, but then it was actually one of those friends, one of my atheist friends encouraged me and said, you know, you probably should go. You probably should just go smile, take the pictures. You know, that's be a good dad. That's what a good dad would do. It's not about you. It's not about what you believe or disbelieve. Hey, you can talk to her about that later. You know, that was, that's what my friend told me. And so I said, that's good advice. I think that's what I'm going to do. And so that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I went there for her baptism service. And uh, that day, but uh, sort of an, uh, an unexpected thing happened in my heart. And not just that day, but following that, um, I, I really experienced a sense of joy. And it wasn't something I was putting on. It wasn't just a, a, an artifact of being around my daughters, which always made me happy, you know. Well, not always, but usually, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> depending on how well they were getting along. But, um, but it was a real core joy 
you know, a, a joy that Annabelle had embraced Jesus. And talk about cognitive dissonance. That was extreme cognitive dissonance. Because, you know, I'm thinking to myself, here I am. Uh, I am the faculty advisor for UGA atheists. I talk about against this religion all the time. I go out onto campus and actually try to dissuade people from believing in a personal God and specifically the God of the Bible. And now the one of the three people that I love the most on this planet that I have certainly the deepest affections for has made this, whatever you want to call it, personal decision for Christ, received Christ, uh, decided to follow Christ, and I'm not angry about this. I'm actually joyful. That's really confusing to me. If I'm if I'm sure that it's false, if I'm sure she's making a bad decision by doing this, shouldn't I be angry? Shouldn't I have some sense of righteous indignation where I want to go and talk her out of this? And that's just not at all where I found myself. So this was very much the um, preliminary changes, I would say, that were that were getting me to a point where I knew that atheism wasn't a good fit and I wasn't going to continue uh, staying with, especially, I, I would have still considered myself very much a secular humanist. I had no intention of changing that, but on the spirituality um, topic, it was it was more like, okay, I'm, I'm certain, certainly open to uh, spiritual possibilities now. That was about the point in time where I came across the uh, the guys with the Great Exchange Outreach. Mm. So what happened there? Who are the guys with the Great Exchange Outreach? <laughs> okay, so yeah, the Great Exchange is a um, it's a an outreach or an evangelistic uh, survey, which is really just a nine question survey. So you just ask people walking by, hey, do you have a few minutes to take a spiritual interest survey? And, and you know, roughly half the people, uh, depending on where you are, will say yes. And so it asks questions like, um, describe your spiritual background. What was that like? Uh, do you believe in God? What, uh, what do you think God is like? What do you see as the greatest problem in the world today? Is there a solution to that problem? And really, it's kind of a funnel, but the... the the real kicker question is, if you were to stand before God and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? And, uh, well, I, I skipped a couple questions. One of the questions is, you know, who in your opinion is Jesus Christ? And so you just write down in a few words what the person uh, says. And the, the last item is, uh, if you could know God personally, would you like to? And, you know, if the person says yes, then the idea is to take, you ask, do you, do you have about three to five minutes? I would like to tell you what the Bible says, what scripture says about how you can know God personally. So um, it was the first ever Great Exchange event. It was on Good Friday, Good Friday of 2011, uh, which was an extraordinarily late Good Friday that year. I remember at the very end of the semester. And um, I, I was approached as I was walking across the Tate Plaza at UGA. And, and uh, so I, what I did is I gave all of the atheistic answers <laughs> to the questionnaire. And mind you, I had checked out on atheism at this point. The, the true response for a lot of those questions would be, I just don't know. You know, for the past several years, I've been calling myself an atheist. I really went kind of extreme with that. That's not where I am now. But, you know, I just, I really don't know uh, who Jesus is. Uh, I'm open to the possibilities. And, and so this was the, the Holy Spirit at work, uh, arranging this particular time and circumstance for me to meet some guys, specifically uh, Pastor David Holt. He wanted to know, you know, what got me, kind of like what we've been talking about here, what got me into skepticism, what got me into atheism, where I truly was now, and uh, specifically, what did I make of Jesus? What did I make of the claims of Jesus of Nazareth? So we started meeting once a week on Fridays, I believe it was, uh, in downtown Athens at a coffee shop, uh, just to talk about those things. 
Well, yeah, that's interesting that he he started by asking you questions and trying to really get a sense of who you are, what you were thinking, rather than just you know pounding you with information or what you should believe. That he was actually willing to take the time with mm-hmm. you to really explore what your thinking was. Right. So where did where did it go from there? Did you start studying certain things or? Or how did how did yeah. Dr. Holt lead you? Yeah, eventually I did. Um, I, that was after a few meetings. Uh, the first, you know, we talked for about an hour that day at the Great Exchange, and I gave him, I believe, I gave him my email. I know I received an email from him uh, within a few days, maybe that that same night. I don't remember. Which, you know, hey, great meeting you today. Um, I think your your story, what you've uh, described as fascinating. And he asked me to, uh, like kind of where, why do you disbelieve in God or what are your intellectual problems with the God of the Bible? Just a very open-ended thing. And, uh, I think he was looking for a more succinct response than what I (laughs) returned to him, but I, I probably sent him back about 10 or 12 paragraphs worth of information. And uh, of course I didn't know David, we're you know, very close now, but, um, I got a response. Anybody who knows David, this will resonate with, it's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> and I'm like, really? That's it. <laughs> then he, he, he followed it up very quickly with, can you meet, you know, would you, are you open to getting together, getting coffee? Because I really I- want to talk to you one-on-one. Uh, and you can explain mm-hmm. maybe more specifically, uh, where you've been, what, what journey you've been on. So we started doing that. Yeah, I'm, I'm I guess, a, a little bit surprised at, that you were so willing to meet with a pastor. Um, but it shows that you did have a willingness or an openness to actually explore at that point. Mm-hmm. And I think that's yeah, huge. And he's just a very, he, you know, he's very gifted. He has a, an amazing ability to connect the people and to to hear them, to, I think, validate them without um, compromising what he believes. And just mm-hmm. really, you know, and people are, are eager for that. People are so eager. You know, we've I, I've heard it referred to as evangelism with our ears, right? Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm terrible at, by the way. <laughs> There's a lot of room for growth with me, but... I'm aware of that and I try to do better, but asking people the questions and really letting them, uh, it doesn't matter who we're talking to, whether it's an atheist or an agnostic or a Muslim or a Buddhist, we don't want to go in and tell them what they believe, right? We want to ask questions and let them tell us. And of course, naturally, that's going to uh, to build rapport and, and open up doors. So as he, you were having a conversation and he was asking you questions, was he trying to rebut your points or was he just continuing to ask questions? And then where did that lead? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, he, he did not, he, again, unlike me, probably <laughs> my tendency, he did not jump on the opportunity to say, no, you're wrong about that. And let me give you seven reasons <laughs> that shows that my position is correct. Um, rather just really ask the questions and good follow-up questions. I remember at some point, I think maybe it was the second or third meeting we had where we talked about so many things and he says, well, what would you say right now at this point where we've been, this journey you've been on, um, one or two of, of the big issue things that you see, uh, that really keep you away from, from, placing your faith in Christ? And I think that's a great question, you know, when you're at that point with a skeptic. And so I thought about it for a minute and I said, okay, well, two, uh, there are really two that, that pop into my mind. Um, number one is evolution. And okay, this is not where I am now, but I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist. I, that's what I do. That's my background. That's my education. I, teach one of the things I teach here at UGA is a seminar on evolutionary psychology. And, you know, this is settled science and there's just really no way that I think I can reconcile that with what it says in the book of Genesis. 
okay, again, my tendency would be to start giving people disproofs. And I'm not saying there's never a role for that. There can be a role for that. But that's not what David did. He said, okay, what's the other one? <laughs> like, rather than objecting, just, okay, I'm, I'm, he's, list, he's still in listening mode. Right. And uh, what a great example. And I said, okay, the other one that I, of, of all the things that could be considered, um, is, is the doctrine of hell, of eternal punishment. And I don't understand how um, it can be just or fair that people would spend eternity in hell for, which is infinite punishment for finite sin. And uh, again, he didn't start rebutting. I know he knows good answers to both of those questions but he didn't jump in with those. And what he said instead was, he said, you know, those are really deep questions. Um, you're, you're going to have to spend some time thinking through those and investigating and reading and praying. He's like, but he said, but, um, you know, we've been, <laughs> we've been talking about Jesus and really that is the bullseye. That is the bullseye of Christianity, the person of Jesus, the work of Jesus, specifically, um, the biblical claim and the, the claim of the apostles that Jesus um, died and rose again, the resurrection of Jesus. And um, that was, I think, at the point where he gave me what we call the 21-day challenge. It wasn't in the 21-day form, but the just a challenge to read the Gospel of John. It has 21 chapters. These are not like chapters in a novel. These chapters, you can read a chapter in like three to five minutes. And uh, so the idea of the challenge is to devote five minutes a day, read one chapter a day, and just ask God, say, God, I don't even know if you're real. I don't know exactly who Jesus is. I, I would like to know uh, if, if uh, this book is true, if it's accurate, if, if this is giving me valid information and true information about Jesus, please reveal that uh, in my heart in a way that I'll understand it as I read. David just gave me the challenge to read the Gospel of John. He's like, would you mind doing that? Just we'll meet again next week, next Friday, between now and then, you know, get out your Bible and, and, and read it. And I told him I would. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself at the time, you know, I don't mind doing it. I'll read it. I didn't say this out loud. I'll read it, but I already know what it says. I grew up in church, right? I grew up memorizing Bible verses. I, I, I know that it says Jesus died and rose again. I, mm -hmm. I, I know that. So what good's going to do me opening up my Bible and reading? And so I went home and I was cleaning my apartment. I'm there by myself, which I never did. And so I think this is also a divine appointment, right? Right. And I'm dusting my, one of my bookshelves and, uh, Right there between two of my psychology textbooks is uh, my old NIV study Bible from when mm -hmm. I was a kid, teenager. And it, it triggered my memory. And I said, oh, yeah, I, uh, I told Pastor David that I would uh, read the Gospel of John. I have no excuse. Here it is, you know, 6, 6.30 p.m. I've got nothing to do tonight. The semester was over at this point. Grades had been submitted. Nothing but lull time. And I'm like, I really have no excuse. And so I sat down there on my couch. As I opened the Bible, I thought again to myself, what's the point? It's not going to make a difference. I already know what this says. But I said, well, I told him I would do it, so I'm going to do it. And I began reading. And what did you find? Well, a lot of um, familiarity, things I hadn't thought about for years. The stories, you know, of course, sounded very familiar um, Jesus meeting the woman at the well, his, uh, in John 3, his, his discussion with Nicodemus, um, that was all very familiar territory. And um, it, it was, it was uh, for lack of a better term, it was just fun. It was kind of fun revisiting that territory. Um, and then I, I really, I got to John chapter 11, which is halfway through the, the narrative of, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And uh, what really, I would say the real turning point, at least in my, my brain, was um, his words to Martha, you know, there, I think it's John eleven twenty five. 25. Martha's confused. Why did you let our brother Lazarus die? If you had been here, he would have lived. And, um, you know, Jesus says, well, your brother will rise again. And Martha doesn't know what he's talking about. 
you know, in the last day, Lord, I know at the end of time that he will rise, all of the dead will rise, so who will rise then? And then Jesus makes that I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then, you know, the real, the real kicker, do you believe this? And in the context of the narrative, of course, he's talking to Martha. But I really knew in my heart. That's just the best way to describe it. I can't intellectualize this. I, if the skeptics who are listening, I don't know a way to intellectualize this to them. I'm not trying to. I would just say in the deepest re recesses of my heart, I knew that the Christ, the Messiah, was putting the same question to me. And mm -hmm. I knew that my answer was that I did. I don't know why. I don't know how. But I knew that I did believe that. I'd like to pause for a moment and tell you about the C.S. Lewis Institute. We are living in a day and time when Christianity is being increasingly marginalized and even canceled, when distractions are prevalent and intentionality towards spiritual growth is curbed. More than ever, we are in need of deeper intentional discipleship as we face challenges in today's world. The C.S. Lewis Institute is here to serve you your study groups, and your church in creating mature disciples who know and live out their biblically grounded faith in Jesus Christ. They provide thoughtful, intelligent resources for individuals, groups, and Bible studies. They provide a year-long fellows program for spiritual growth among like-minded Christians pursuing faith in a serious, structured way. And they host events with respected Christian authors and thinkers to help us understand scripture and the Christian worldview. They also help us engage culture in effective ways. We hope you'll not only take a look at these offerings, but also prayerfully consider donating to this ministry. You can find out more about the C.S. Lewis Institute and give by going to our website at www.cslewisinstitute.org. Now back to our story. That's amazing. So in that moment, you. I'm sure it was a surprise to yourself. Yeah, it was. Um, so at that moment, the the whole concept, you know, Pastor David had talked about who Jesus was and his resurrection was the most important question to consider. And here you are confronted with the narrative of Lazarus being resurrected, but somehow it affected you in terms of Jesus saying, I am the resurrection, um, that it was something more than just a rational statement, that there was something deeply spiritual about that and deeply real. Um, did it, I'm sure you finished the, the book of John and you met with, with Pastor David. Did the that question of Jesus and the actual resurrection of Christ and its association with his proclamation of being the resurrection, did that come into play in terms of your belief or confirming that more intuitive, deep, personal belief in his statement of who he is? Yeah, it definitely did. Uh, I think, you know, I, I really, the question comes sometimes, you know, when was I born again? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. I guess I'll find out if it's important. To, <laughs> is, does the time scale really matter? Uh, I don't know. I, I, if there was a moment in time, I do look to that moment as being the moment, but I could be wrong about that. I would say more than anything, it was just a, it was a seed. It was a big seed. It was a huge seed, but it was a seed that was planted. I, I knew that, my um, recognition of the truthfulness of who Jesus was and is, that he wasn't just making a proclamation of what he had the power to do. He was talking about his identity. You know, he, he didn't say, I can raise the dead. He said, I am the resurrection. And those, I'd never seen that before. You know, I knew that verse, that, that verse sounded familiar to me, but I'd never, ever seen it in that light before. And so that was the real what I realized at that point in time was this truth is going to have to change everything about my life. 
Um, you know, there's a lot we could go into, I, but to really bring all of that to fruition um, took another two or three years. Um, but I could never, even though I tried, there was a point in time where I actually tried to divest myself of all of this. I wanted to go back to secularism about two years later mm. and even tried to, but I could just never turn my back. Uh, I could never turn that off in my mind, in my heart, this truth of Jesus is the son of God. He died and he rose again. Um, it was, everything was stripped away back to that, but it ultimately was that truth that brought me to a point of completely surrendering my life, not just my mind, but also my entire, kind of getting off the fence of cultural Christianity, which I would say I was on for the first two or three years of this, finally getting kicked off of that fence in uh, late 2014. It really was that truth that was, was the anchor. Mm. I can imagine a skeptic listening to your story and just saying, oh, you just had an experience. You were looking for something, you know, and you saw what you wanted to see of Jesus when you started reading the Bible. But, you know, how does this match with you call yourself, you're calling yourself a scientist? How can all of this, you know, the way that you viewed superstition in the past, why don't you view it that way now? You know, what is how how do you integrate essentially your mind and your intellect with your beliefs um, just because you you believe Jesus is the truth which which we do and that his claim and his claim to be the resurrection is true but how you know I can just again hear a, a skeptic saying how can you forsake your mind and, and all of that you know about reality were the pieces able to come together yeah. And, well, I think that's sort of an ongoing thing. You know, I do decidedly come down on the, uh, the, the Christian side of this thing now, and, and I can appreciate their question from, from their perspective. It's genuine. It's a good question. It's not a question that I can really, again, over intellectualize to them. I can talk about my journey. Um, we can, and we should point people to resources to, you know, sometimes what we, talk about us, uh, what's, what's been called the legal historical case for the resurrection, the changes in the lives of the apostles, their eventual martyrdom, the, this being the catalyst for Christianity spreading across three continents within its first generation. Um, there's all of these facts, and I do talk about those a lot, but I, you know, I am convinced that the Bible makes it pretty clear, you know, going back to John chapter three, Jesus dialogue with Nicodemus, uh, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about heaven or hell there. He talks about that in other places. He's talking about the ability to see the work of God, right? The, you know, we, we, we perceive as scientists, as um, naturalists, we perceive the the uh, three-dimensional world around us, Jesus obviously is talking about something that is, what's, what would be the uh, trans-dimensional, something that involves a reality that, that transcends the three-dimensional reality around us. And he's, and he's saying this is the, the ultimate and true reality, and a human being can't even begin to fathom that unless they've, had, they've been born again by the Holy Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that is going to sound like a cop-out to a skeptic. I get it, right? The only thing I can say is that I've experienced that, right? And I, I don't know who it was. Uh, it was a brilliant mind who said that the man with a, a, a testimony is, is never at the mercy of a man with an intellectual argument, <laughs> mm. right? Um, I, I mean, I get it, but I, it, it's kind of like you've, you've got to really jump in that pool and start splashing around or if you just try to say okay this is going to be a purely intellectual endeavor to me nothing more and nothing less i'm just going to analyze it in the uh, complete a completely rational and logical sense i don't think you can ever get there i don't think anyone has ever argued into the kingdom of god that way there has to be you know the the proverbial door of the heart that is at least cracked open to the possibility of, of this all being true.
Mm. Thank you for that. And I and I would presume then that the the cognitive dissidence that you had within your naturalistic materialism or atheism, that some of those issues are resolved even existentially, like being able to explain or ground your freedom to choose, or like you say, the where human human dignity comes from, rights and values, or, or things like that. That it seems that you have a, a more coherent worldview, which not only to think, but also to experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, one of the um, groups that we help lead on the campus of the University of Georgia now is called uh, Ratio Christi, and, and it's Latin for a reason for Christ. And so we take on, you know, a lot of these apologetics themes and topics. My favorite uh, recently, because I think it is so timely, it's perennial in one sense, but it's very timely in another, is, you know, what we call the moral argument for God, that um, if, if God does not exist, then um, then there are no objective moral truths. Uh, tr- you know, what is moral, what is right and wrong in a, in a naturalistic framework is just what feels. It's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of how many people feel strongly one way or the other. Um, but the truth of the matter is that all sane and rational people recognize that there are certain moral truths, moral absolutes that are that are not subjective. They're not open to opinion, right? Human rights, value, things like, um, you know, you can think of the extreme murder is, is, is wrong. And if a person says it's okay to murder, it's not like they have the wrong opinion. They're factually wrong. When we say racism, there's a big one. Uh, you know, racism is when I say that it's wrong. And here my atheist friends almost always agree with me, you know, thank God, my agnostic friends agree with me, Buddhist, Muslim, on down the, we all could say, okay, well, when we see these racist things happening, people being the victims of race crimes, wow, that's truly wrong. That's not just my opinion, that is a moral fact, that's a moral absolute. Um, I would understand that as only being possible uh, if human beings are more than stardust. We're not just um, the end result of a certain conglomeration of st- stardust, you know, uh, being rearranged and reassembled by natural laws over billions of years can never get you to that point where we say humans have objective worth, objective dignity, objective value. And consequently, you know, well, racism is wrong, murder is wrong, sexual assault is wrong. That's not just an opinion. Those are moral facts. And so that, I would say, is, is one of my favorite questions and discussions to have with my skeptical friends and uh, certainly something I would encourage uh, fellow believers to look into and at least you know, ask those questions to our atheist friends. Do you believe that humans have real dignity and worth and value? And if so, uh, according to your worldview, like what is that based upon? And then, you know, just, just listen to them. Listen to, don't try to trick them up or, you know, gotcha. That's not the point. But really just have them think through it out loud with you. That's great advice. Uh, Rich, it sounds like that your, your world and your worldview both have changed dramatically. Um, that you, not, not only from the, the kind of more superficial Christianity you held as a, as a child and a teenager and even early adult, but obviously changed from your militant atheism or even your agnosticism. You've come to a place where you're, you seem very passionate about what you believe now and that you're helping others to understand uh, the same. So, or at least challenging in their worldview. I, I take it that your world and your worldview have changed dramatically. Can you talk with me about how that has transformed your life? There's a, I would say there's a coherency there that was lacking in my life before. You know, I, I, um, I don't think I realized at the time, but I think that sort of postmodern um, secular humanism, which was a big part of what we did in, you know, UGA atheists and that type of advocacy, uh, 
I wouldn't say it's necessarily bent towards radical indiv individualism, but it tends in that direction, right? Um, the, the emphasis being on self, charting your own path through life, doing ultimately like doing good for others, but really, you know, the in so far as much as it also benefits you. And in one sense, that's very reasonable. But I would say, you know, what change has there been in sort of my philosophy of life since then? Uh, just that recognition that is that, that observation that's so apparent in the New Testament. I think of the verse in Romans where it says that we are individually members one of another. Mm -hmm. right? this, this organism, this spiritual organism, this uh, what Paul calls the temple of God, which is the church, not a, not a temple made out of bricks and mortar and those sorts of things, but uh, out of individual souls. And um, just being, uh, understanding that my purpose in life, the reason why I'm on this planet for however many more years that the Lord has me here is to be a functional part of that body. Um, we don't all look alike. We don't all have the same role. Paul uses the metaphor of the body. You know, some are hands, some are feet, some are mouth, some are ears in the body of Christ. But God has given me a specific role. And my, my life is not about, you know, the, the radical individualism that I used to live for. I think most people would have said I was a pretty good guy. You know, my, um, my peers tended to like me when I was an atheist and I got good reviews and wow, people wanted to take that class and Probably in the worldly sense, people thought that I was a, a pretty good guy, but I, I know that I was very selfish. I know my life was about me and, and really nothing beyond that. Understanding now that the church, the body of Christ, being part of that body, announcing the kingdom, right? These are the things that um, occupy my time and thoughts in my life mm now. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So, Rich, as we're winding up this, your story, and it's just really amazing. Um, and it sounds like you have a lot of experience, not only as a skeptic, but talking to skeptics. If you have any advice for the curious skeptic who might be listening in, what would that be? Yeah. So what I would say is um, truth exists and truth matters. Uh, one of the things I really liked about the, the atheist movement, I know that sounds strange to say that, but I, I do believe that this is a good thing, is that uh, myself at the time and most committed atheists that I talk to today would affirm that objective truth exists, right? We're not, uh, most of the atheists I talk to are not uh proponents of relative truth in the ultimate sense. They would say that there is such a thing as ultimate reality, that it has a certain nature, and we can have discourse and discussion about those things because uh, truth is a meeting ground, right? <laughs> that, that is more than anything, that's what truth does. It, it unites and it, it divides, uh, but it is there. And our quest should be to... I, I, I'm just popped into my mind. One of the things that Matt Dillahoney used to say of all people, he said, I want to believe as many true things as possible and reject as many false things as possible. I think that's great. That's one of the best quotes that we could bring to the table here. Uh, I do believe that truth exists. And, you know, going back to Christ, his, his claim was not just to teach the truth, his claim was to be the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I do believe that a person with a, an open mind, uh, a posture of honesty at heart, being willing to go where the information leads, um, will see Jesus and will come to see Jesus in an entirely new light. Mm. Yeah. And, and I would imagine based upon your own experience too, reading the, the gospel of John is probably a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Any of the gospels, I, I have a fondness for the gospel of John, but if you want to do the 16 day challenge, Hey, you can do Mark, you know, it's not quite as much of a commitment. 
<laughs> yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> kind of short and sweet. He's yeah. a very pragmatic writer. So if there are Christians today, obviously there were Christians who played a role in your life in terms of bringing you towards what you now to believe as truth. Um, like that pastor, Pastor uh, David. David. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how would you encourage us as Christians to engage or interact with those who are skeptical or don't believe? Yeah, so if, if you'll allow me, I'll preach to myself a little bit because I always have to remind myself. Um, you know, I like to debate. I, I've always liked that, regardless of which end of this I've been on. It's always been extremely enjoyable to me to, you know, for, for people to push back and let's let's butt heads a little bit, not in a mean-spirited way, but let's exchange ideas. And uh, I, I've come to realize that not everyone has the same affinity for that as I have. And um, there is very much a necessary role of being good listeners. Uh, knowing some good questions, right? Uh it, it, they don't have to be enormously complex. We meet people all of the time. The great exchange questions are a great starting point. What, what was your spiritual background like? Do you, do you believe in God? Uh, if so, what is God like? Um, and even if the person expresses um, disbelief, then, you know, well, who in your opinion is Jesus of Nazareth? I think that's one of the best questions, possibly the best question that we could ask. Uh, we don't ask them telling them what they believe, again. We just ask them because we really want to know. Um, if, if a person is going to be intellectually honest, then they're going to have to do something with this historical figure. Uh, the person, the man who has undeniably influenced the history of the world, more than any other person. What is true about him? What can we know about him? Why did he leave such an enormous impact? And I think those are fair questions for, for anyone. Mm, I think that's great advice. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I can almost see Jesus turning to his apostles and saying, who do you say that I am? Um, and that is, that is the, the biggest question for, for everyone. You know, so thank you. That's very, that's very wise. I mean, your story, it has such an arc to it um, from embracing some form of Christianity, dismissing it, militant atheism, but then being drawn back to truth. I mean, truth has been a, a major thread throughout from the beginning to the end. And Rich, I want to thank you for coming on board to tell your story. I'm sure many people will enjoy it, relate to it, and really be inspired by it. So thank you for the wisdom that you've given us today. Absolutely. It's been a real joy. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Side B Stories to hear Rich's story. You can find out more about him by visiting his website, askaformeratheist.com. And we'll include that link along with the link to his work at Ratio Christi in the episode notes. For questions and feedback about this episode, you can reach me by email at sidebstories at gmail.com. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, that you will rate and subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and social network. In the meantime, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next time, where we'll see how another skeptic flips the record of their life.